Over to you, Jill. Good morning, everybody. How are we all today? Um, good to see you all back. Thanks again for joining us. Um, we are doing, um, what are we doing this morning? We're doing seeds and sourcing this morning. Stop laughing, Sharon. I've got my glasses on. So, um, yeah, seeds and sources this morning. You know what, what we're all about. Um, you know where Thursday grows. You know what we're up to. So I don't think we need to go through all that again. Okay, but what I thought we would have a wee look at today is... Um, our seeds and sourcing. So um, we're going to be looking a little bit about uh, seed types and seed quality and seed viability and the storage just very quickly and um, choosing the varieties and the sources that you want to buy. So there's um, some bits coming up um, which hopefully will, will be useful to you um, and I guess there's a, a little bit of an opinion coming up, I guess, from Sharon and I as well about something. So we'll keep that to ourselves just now. But uh, <laughs> you know what it is, Sharon. Um, it's very much our own opinion, but um, we feel it's quite an important one. So we're going to tell, um, we're going to tell you guys about it as well. Um, so really just having a wee look at the types of seed that's available, varieties, what we mean when we say things like variability, um, viability, sorry, and um, just letting you understand a few terms and things. We've got a little bit of a breakout room today as well. Um, I'll leave Sharon to discuss what we're going to do um, with that um, over next week's session. Um, and then we'll go over any questions that we've got from the PowerPoint because there might be some. Uh, I'm just going to pop a little disclaimer in here. First of all, um, I am not um, a botanist in any sense of the word at all. Um, I do have a little bit of an understanding of um, genetic side when it comes to, to the genetic side that we talk a little bit about today. Please don't get hung up on it. You do not need to understand all of this. Uh, you do not need to remember all of this. Um, but I, I do have a little bit of experience. I used to teach a little bit of basic genetics, but that was on animal behaviour. So um, don't get hung up about this, but it is quite important that you understand why we're asking you um, to think carefully about the seeds that you choose. So we'll cover any questions that come up on that and I will do my best to answer any questions that you've got about it, but don't get hung up about it. Um, and then we've got a wee conclusion and um, a roundup of our sort of four weeks. And then we've got next week coming with our questions and answers. So does that all sound okay, everybody? Happy with that. <laughs> I can see some heads nodding. So, um, Sharon, do you want to organise our breakout rooms for just now? Yeah, great. Thanks, Jill. Um, oh, a couple of housekeeping things, if that's all right, just before we go into oh, breakout rooms. <laughs> you. Um, I think and hope that everyone has got an email from me or a WhatsApp message in the last couple of days with the links to last week's video that's uploaded on YouTube now, an invitation um, to join the WhatsApp group. So if you haven't already and you want to join the WhatsApp group, then just send me a message as per the email. Um, and I'm just going to plug it <laughs> this Thursday. We've got, um, I'm really excited actually. I went, I attended one with some of these speakers a couple of months back, but we've got some speakers talking about climate change and, and climate change action, particularly here in the Highlands. So we've got someone from Plastic at Bay who's um, over in Durness Way. Um, we've got someone from Stop Climate Chaos Scotland presenting uh, particularly about the um, conference that's in Glasgow later on in November this year. And then we've got Joan from Thursday, from Thursday Community Development Class and someone from the Laird Learning Centre talking about action in the Highlands. So there was a poster attached and information, but if anyone wants to join, then just drop me a message. Cool, we're gonna do something radical. We've lost half of you. Um, we're going to do what's called a breakout room. So what's going to happen is I'm going to split you into smaller rooms with just a few people in them. And we're going to give you about five minutes in that room just to chat. I'd recommend you introduce yourself. So maybe your name, take maybe 30 seconds, your name. Hi, I'm Sharon. I've got a garden. I'm new to growing, something like that. Um, uh, introduce yourselves, meet each other, and also then to... Maybe just chat a little bit about anything that you'd like to cover next week. So have a chat amongst yourselves, a sort of free-flowing conversation in that five minutes. And if one of you can just make a couple of notes, because when we pop back into the main group, I'm going to ask you to upload any points or, or things that you want to cover next week into the chat box. So if one of you can collect the information 
and just type it all up in the chat box when you come back. So you'll be in your breakout room for about five minutes. Um, there's going to be three to four people in the breakout room. So a nice small group. You'll have five minutes just to have a chat. Um, and then someone write that down. And if you can add that back in. Um, and just follow your nose, guys. You're about to get invited to join a breakout room. So press yes, join it. And then we'll see you in five minutes. And if you get stuck and you're still here, that's totally fine. You can have a chat with me and Jill. <laughs> Join, that's it, Ros. <laughs> How you doing, Joanna? Jill, I might leave you here with jo Joanna and I'll go and join one of the breakout rooms. Is that okay? Yep. Unless you want me. Do you want me? No, it's okay. Uh, I think Joanna's on two different devices because she's in one of the rooms. Oh, right. Okay. That's fine. That's okay, isn't it? Oh, I've got a wee chart there. Who's on the wee chart? Oh, no. It's okay. It's just a thumbs up from Laura. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, I'm going to join a breakout room. Um, I'll just stop the recording. Hi, uh, it's, it's Glasgow today. Um, the University Gardens. Uh-huh. Yeah. University Gardens. Ali. Oh, Ali. Getting a lot of mutes. Previous. That's better. <laughs> Poor Ali was um, having difficulty um, being heard because of some interference. Yes, there's a lot of interference on your line, Ali. I probably can't help it, whatever it no, is. No, no, it's probably weather-related <laughs> weather as well, I should imagine. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. So I think, I think we're all back now, Jill. Which is okay. Having done that sort of short... Um, thing <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. if, if you if you have any things that come up in your group if, if one of you or all of you or any of you anything that nudged anything even if you didn't talk about it in the group but it nudged a thought that you're thinking pop it in the chat in the next sort of half an hour there's no pressure but it'll just really help us to focus in next week on things that we're going to talk about and i hope that you enjoyed that that um that pop-out room i hope it was good and you got a chance to meet new people so i'm just going to pop people on mute and we're going to hand over to jill who's got a powerpoint presentation <laughs> yes, I do indeed. I do indeed. Right, share screen, share screen. Bear with me, people. Um, I think it's that one. Share. Have we got it? Oh, wait a minute. Here we are. Uh, slideshow. From beginning. Um, and as in previous sessions, if people have questions come up during your slideshow, again, just pop them in the chat. And if we get time, it's about quarter past 10. This is about a 20 minute slideshow, isn't it? So if we get time, we'll, we'll go over them at the end. If not, we'll try and capture them. Okay. Okay, seeds and sourcing then. Some s little points for you to consider. Um, so here we go again with our consider, accept, cooperate. So we need to consider seed production when we're thinking about quality of our seed. Um, seed production, of course, is subject very much to the vagaries of climate. So we know that the climate um, can affect things in a huge way. We know that seed is grown all over the world. And you just have to um, bear that in mind when you're considering um, seed collecting and stuff like that as well that it, it will um, be affected by the climate some of those harvests can be um, really good for our seeds and others can be quite a poor harvest and again you just have to accept um, that that is because of climate so you will see that reflected in seed quality you hear farmers talking about it all the time um, 
So the quality of the seed potatoes this year was poor or the quality was good. And that's all been um, reliant on weather. We also need to cooperate with the standards of purity and germination as these are laid down in law. So the reason why they're laid down in law is so that we can all buy good quality seeds. OK, um, so there are regulations concerning this as well. And they are for our own good. Um, when it comes to buying our seeds. So um, now this might, might have changed this next bit. I'm pretty sure it won't have. I can't see any benefit to them having changed it. Um, and I'm not going to get political here, but um, we are, of course, out of the EU now. But seed can only be sold throughout the EU if they are listed in what's called the common catalogue. Um, and in each of the individual member countries, they also have an appropriate national list. So um, I think I'm right in saying that that will still apply. I can't see any benefit to them changing that at all. But as a direct result of some of the modern economic policies and costs that are involved in today's modern markets, this has invariably meant that some of the old heritage varieties were withdrawn um, because they were no longer considered economical. And therefore, you could only obtain some of these seeds um, via heritage libraries, okay? Um, and you only need to think about apples. If you, if you want an example, then look at apples, because if you think about the number of heritage type of apples that we actually had in this country, there were several hundred um, varieties of apples. And yet, if you go into a supermarket today, we've probably got about half a dozen on offer. Um, and so you only have to think about it in that terms to understand what's happened to some of these heritage varieties. That then means um, when we want to go to buy seed, the most popular seed types and varieties are the ones that tend to be in store all the time. And they're the ones that tend to be held by um, garden centers and supermarkets because they're the most economical ones for them to, to sell. The wider choice, um, you will get that in mail order and also online. Um, but the vast majority of ones, it's all the same type that are being sold. So um, moving on, I wanted to have a wee quick look at germination and viability. So we have a couple of terms coming up here. If we think about what these two terms are, let's just go through them. What is seed germination? What do we mean by that? And seed germination is the emergence of the young root through the seed coat, usually at the micropile. So remember that little picture okay. I showed you of the seed example? And we had the young root, which was called the radical, as its proper name. Um, and that pushes its way out through the seed coat, which was, of course, the testa. And that's usually at the micropile. That was that tiny little hole that allowed the water in, but it also allows the root to come out. OK, so that's what we mean by germination. That's just the point where the plant actually starts to break through the seed coat and has successfully made it out. And what is seed viability then? So what's the difference? A viable seed has the potential for germination when the correct external conditions are met. So right now, if you were to go outside and put a seed in the ground just now, like a, a carrot seed maybe, or a sunflower seed, the chances are that you wouldn't get germination because the external conditions outside today are pretty shocking. So they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't, come true then they wouldn't germinate okay so I hope that all makes sense now with that germination and viability all of our seeds deteriorate with age and they will gradually lose that ability to germinate most rapidly under damp and hot conditions okay so you always want to try and store your seeds in a dry and cool environment if you have problems with mice um, out in my shed, for example, um, every winter I get mice coming in to shelter from the weather. So they're stored in rodent proof containers and ensure that everything is labelled correctly because some of these seeds look really similar. And if you lose the labels to things, you're not going to have a clue what it is you're actually sowing. So always remember to label things correctly as well. What you do Can find. I... Sorry. Oh. Sorry, I'm getting a wee bit of um, noise in the background here. I hope you can all still hear me. Um, you, what you do sometimes get, if you think about um, buying electrical goods, 
things like mobile phones and stuff like that as well. You get these little silica gel packets inside and they are um, a desiccant, a drying agent, which is used to help um, keep things dry while the product is in storage. These are brilliant to pop in amongst your seed boxes as well because they'll do the same job in there too. The ability of seed to germinate depends greatly on how you store it. Okay, and it is quite important that you store your seeds correctly. There is something else here that we need to consider a little bit as well though. The ability to store the seed also depends on the type of seed that it actually is. Now in the main, there are two types of seeds. You have what is called an orthodox seed. And these are things like our lettuces, like our carrots, like our cabbages. There's a huge variety of orthodox seed out there. And all that means is that these are seeds that can be dried and cooled, which will then slow the aging process. And that is what allows us to be able to put them into packets and use them, in some cases, hundreds of years later, in some cases, thousands of years later. One of the workshops I attended um, was um, hosted by a man called Greg Kenneser, Dr. Greg Kenneser, who's a botanist um, with the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. And he told us about a Judean date palm. This is a type of seed that um, had been accidentally stored, was then discovered, was then germinated, and it successfully germinated 2,000 years later. So they had growing Judean date palms, which the seed was 2,000 years old. Okay, so some of them will stay for a long, long time. But these orthodox seeds, they need cool, dry conditions. So don't leave them in a warm kitchen where humidity levels are rising and dropping all the time. Don't keep them on a windowsill or in a damp shed because that will affect their seed storing ability. Ideally, store them below freezing. We can't always do that, but for every plus five degree Celsius rise above zero, the storage life of the seed can be halved. So it does definitely need to be somewhere cool. As I've said, use a rodent proof airtight jar, a tin or a sealable box and place it in a cool room. But examples of these orthodox seed include things like broad beans, broccolis, carrots, and flowers like nigella, love in a mist, okay, to give it its common name. So the other type of seed that we then get, I can never say this, recalcitrant seed. In other words, unorthodox. And again, don't worry about the terms here. Just remember that there are two different types. These are seeds which cannot tolerate drying or freezing. They need cool, moist conditions to survive, and they will only survive for a very, very short period of time. That could be as long as a month, or it could be four months. I don't think from memory any of them could go past six months. So it just shows you the difference that these seeds will survive. I think you'd be very lucky to see them past four months. Examples of this would include oak trees, horse chestnut, willow, elm, avocados, mango, rubber plants, and cocoa plants. So those are the two different types of seed that we've got. Just very quickly, a little table here <clears throat> showing you some of the viability that we have. Um, tomatoes and legumes, these are our pea plants. Well, they will last up to about 10 years. Brassicas, lettuce, endives, chicory, about four or five years, but many of them will fall off after about two years. So if you have any seeds of those in your box after two years, you're probably just as well to replace them. Onions and leeks will deteriorate after about two years. And some of our root veg and our parsnip and our sweet corn, they are very rapid deterioration. So you really, really need to buy them fresh every year. Okay, I hope that all is making sense. If you want to test your seed for viability, if you've got limited resources and you don't want to go wasting a load of compost to find in two weeks time that they're not going to germinate, then you can do this in your kitchen at home. Find a small dish, fill it with a piece of foam rubber or a bit of sponge to retain some moisture and wet it, pop it in your wee dish. Cover it with a 
double layer of paper toweling and on top of your paper toweling place the seeds that you want to germinate on top. Put them then somewhere warm with at least a temperature of 21 degrees. Cover them with a plastic bag and then again check them in a fortnight. If there's nothing coming through within the fortnight then you definitely know cut your losses, don't use up any um, compost on them and go and get yourself some fresh seed. So that's a quick way or a quick air way to do it. The other thing that we wanted to just take you through with this as well was a little bit about the seed types and the different shapes, sizes and forms that these all come in. We are all familiar with the little foil packs of seeds. They are sealed and these seeds in there will remain viable until they are opened. And from that point, normal deterioration rates will then occur. We have things like um, what's called naked seeds, and these are ordinary individual seeds, like a lettuce seed or a pea seed. There's a slight anomaly in this one. Beetroot gets classed as a naked seed, and actually it's not, because when you look inside a beetroot seed, it's not just one individual plant in there. There can sometimes be two or three in there, which is why you always need to thin beetroot. So there's a good wee example of that one. Pelleted seed have been covered with a protective material and that is usually to make them easier to handle. So these can be seeds which are difficult to, to grasp or get a hold of and they'll put a wee seed coat around them to protect them and then that just breaks down in the soil once you start to sow them and wet them. You have pills. Pills are another type of pelleted seed and these are mainly used by commercial seed growers. You also get things like seed tapes and sheets. And these are brilliant. The best example I can give you for these are carrots. So it reduces the need to thin your carrots. So when you know when you, thin, uh, when you sow carrot seed, again, they're quite difficult to sow. And you've always got to pull some of them out to then allow the others to grow and develop. On the seed tapes, these have already been spaced out for you across the sheet. You simply roll it out across the top of your surface, you wet it, you cover it, and away you go. They will germinate through it. You also have chitted, or what's known as pre-germinated seed. And these are seed that has just germinated and then is sent out. These can be really, really useful for beginners. A great example I'm thinking of here is cucumbers. So cucumbers require a slightly higher temperature to get them to germinate and then once they're germinated you can reduce the temperatures for, for cucumber. But cucumber can be a bit of an awkward one for beginners. So that's a good way is to buy them pre-germinated and then all you have to do is pop them in the compost and they'll start up and go again. You have prime seed and this is slightly different. This is seed which is just brought to the point of germination, then it's dried, then it's sealed and then it is sent out. And the last one that we have here as well is what's known as dressed or treated seeds. And these have been deliberately dusted with a chemical that is usually to deter some sort of soil borne disease. And it is much more common in larger growing environments. It's not something that you would see quite so much for um, the likes of ourselves as gardeners. It's much more commercial or horticultural based and farming based. These types of seed are not organic. So they might be okay to help farmers with a particular soil borne disease, but they're certainly not an organic way forward. And uh, personally, I don't particularly like them. So, at perfect. If we look at seed, <laughs> if we look at seed types and sourcing then, um, the variety of seed available then is obviously huge and it can be quite bewildering to the novice gardener. However, there are some indicators of quality and suitability that we've got um, coming up to help you here as well. So, we're moving on a little bit here. I'm going through this quite quickly, I'm aware of that. Um, my disclaimer that I said earlier applies from here. What I'm about to try and do in four slides um, has probably taken the best part of 150 years here um, to come to fruition when it comes to um, plant breeding. The father of um, modern genetics, if you like, the man who's credited with it, now we know Charles Darwin did a bit of work, but the, the man who's actually credited with it 
um, the father of modern genetics, is a man who's known as Gregor Johann Mendel. He was a mathematician, he was a biologist, he was also a priest. And what he did was he studied um, what came to be known as Mendelian inheritance. And all that meant was you had a parent plant and he proved in pea plants in 1856 that the genes could pass from the mother down into the young, basically. That's, that's it in about um, 30 seconds compared to 150 years. But this is where all of this comes from, all of this knowledge about plant breeding. Here's a wee video. I'm just going to show you this first. Oh, she said, where has it gone? Can you guys see that? Oh, there we go. Hopefully this works. Oh. You know, I think it almost worked then. Yeah. Went for one second. It did, didn't it? I'm going to try that again. Sorry, folks. No. Okay, let's forget it. Do you want me to try that on mine? Let's keep going. Um. I'm just wondering, it's actually just buffering just a little bit there in front of me now, I can see. I can just explain this as we go. No, that's not happy at all, is it? Forget it. Yeah, we can send it with the email from Edward. It's, from it's fine. It's all right. It's just me going through some terminology. I wanted to just very quickly go through some terminology first before um, I went into this. Um, okay. So here we go. You get a type of seed, which is called F1 hybrids, okay? You will sometimes see on the seed packet first filial. There is a word of caution surrounding these. Um, many new varieties of vegetables and flower seeds are classed as F1 hybrids. And what that means is they're made by crossing two parent lines that have been deliberately inbred over several generations. Now, all of you that have got dogs, you just need to think about this because this is what's been happening with some of our dog breeds. They've been deliberately inbred. And now, of course, we have many problems with some of our dogs, don't we? So just keep that in the back of your mind because this has been deliberately happening with plants as well. Some of it for good reason, I must add. Okay, this is not all doom and gloom. So compared with what we call open pollinated varieties, and all I was explaining in that wee video was what a cultivar was, what an open pollinated variety was, and what um, our F1 hybrids were. Open pollinated varieties, very simple. These are plants which can reproduce all on their own with the help of mother nature, be it with an insect or be it wind pollinated or sometimes occasionally us with our hands where we might get a wee paintbrush and just help the pollination process along by transferring it across. So basically think open pollinated, think that's the normal way that mother nature would do it. So compared with the normal ways, these hybrid plants have exceptional vigor, quality, uniformity, and a resistance to pest and disease, which can be good particularly if you have diseases like club root in your soil, for example, it stays in your soil for around 20 years. So your crop rotation plan would be ruined. Okay, it's extremely difficult to get rid of. And that is probably about the only time where I would maybe consider using one of these varieties if I had a very problematic disease like club root. But there are other ways around it. You don't always just have to go back to, well, I'll just use that seed. A barrier or a physical um, netting, for example, and carrot fly could help reduce carrot fly. So you wouldn't need to use a resistant F1 hybrid breed to, to grow your carrots. There are other ways that you can look at things without always necessarily going straight to these types of seed. However, the downside to them as well is they are very expensive. A new cross has to be made every time that seed is required. Basically, they have to keep breeding the same variety year after year after year because 
these varieties do not breed true and all we mean by that is you would get some sort of fault in the next generation of plants so if we think back to our dog breeding again we fixed specific things in our dogs because we wanted them to hunt or we wanted them to track or we wanted them to guard we fix those traits by by breeding but when you fix those traits and get the good things that you want what a lot of people forget is that doubles up on also the bad things as well which is why we've ended up with some of the problems that we have in our dogs and this is true of plants as well they do not breed true you fix the bit that you want but you can also fix bits that you don't want hybrid seeds are quite commonly used in commercial horticulture very simply because the new varieties that they make they can patent and make it their own variety and that means they can make more money out of it but it's this practice it's this business of hybrids that has been a huge factor in the demise of our heritage seed types the example that i've got with you here is black petunias black petunias are beautiful but black petunias have probably taken about 60 years to create but this very very careful controlled cross-pollination so we have done the pollination of genetically inbred plants you achieve this f1 hybrid and in this example they used a blue petunia a dark red petunia and a yellow petunia over a very long time to actually manage to produce black petunias now they're lovely but the problem with them is if you then try to save the seed from that first plant it will not breed true now if you look at the example that we've got in the picture here you can see that some of the background color there it's more purple than black we've got yellow streaks coming through the flowers we can see the red coming into the flower as well now this example is still very pretty but as i said as well as doubling up any of the features that you do like which was the true rich tones of the first example that we showed you you also can double up any of the genetic <coughs> sorry any of the genetic faults as well and this becomes more apparent when you move forward a step if you want to breed from that f1 hybrid you end up with an f2 hybrid sometimes called a second filial generation you may come across these these are not common but i did see one in the shops once these are two controlled plants from four selected lines so we have one plant with a mother and a father we have a second plant with a mother and a father those two plants are then bred together with that cell for cross fertilization and what you end up with is the f2 hybrid these plants still retain some of the favored characteristics from that lovely black petunia that we saw like the vigor the ability to grow quickly and the disease resistance but the other characteristics like you saw in the second picture the uniformity of the plant and some other less desirable features will also have crept in if we then go to the next picture you'll see what i mean by that so these are still petunias but if you look down closely you can see that the leaves are all mottled and marked so it has a virus you can also see that some of the petals on these plants are deformed so they're not forming correctly and the shape of the flower is also wrong okay so these are some of the issues that we can find when we start um basically not fully understanding what could happen when you start to look at genetics okay there are too many serious and unresearched and unanswered questions over the long-term effects we simply do not know the long-term effects of this type of plant breeding and both Jan and myself feel quite strongly that gardeners really should not be using these types of seeds if you have a plant disease problem and you want to grow cabbages for example you might need to consider using these types of seeds you might need to consider using an f1 hybrid because of the disease resistance but i would urge you to always look around first of all to see if you have other solutions to it so for example 
instead of putting your cabbages in your plot where you would normally grow them, consider putting in a new raised bed or growing them in another type of container that has new compost in it and therefore doesn't have the disease. And that way you avoid having to use the seeds altogether. I hope that makes a bit of sense. I hope that has um, helped a little bit. Um, but please do not get too hung up about it, okay? What you can use then is anything that says suitable for organic growers, anything that's got awards of merit written on it. These are usually from the RHS, okay? What else can you use? Anything that's been classed as certified stock, particularly for vegetables and fruit buying, it should have certified stock written on it. And these come from various um, government memberships whereby you have the Plant Health Association, for example, the Scottish Potato Certification Scheme, for example. These will certify that these things will breed true, that they are disease free, and that they will be healthy and vigorous. So it allows you to be sure that what you're buying is exactly what it says on the tin, okay? And you're not being duped into something else. Now, some of the sources that Sharon and I use, I know Sharon's um, got some more as well. Um, these are some of mine and Sharon's, I think, but these are some of our sources. These are people that we go to. Um, you have Real Seeds, um, a company supplying heritage and older varieties there as well. If you're wanting to actually buy plants, and I think I'm right in saying that plants of distinction are in Scotland as well. I think they're based in Glasgow. I may be wrong, don't quote me on that. But there's plants of distinction there and the addresses, we can put them all up for you. We have Scotia seeds. We have Tamar Organics. Um, I get a lot of my plants from the Royal Horticultural Society themselves. Now they are based down in England. I have to say they are a little bit more expensive, but you know that what you're getting has been bred properly. Um, and you do tend to get bigger plants from them as well. Okay, and the last one on the list there is heritage seeds. Okay, so just a very quick summary then to everything that we've sort of covered in the last four weeks. If you're planning on being organic gardeners, then you need to view your activities as an integrated whole to try and establish a sustainable way forward. Look at the whole picture. Think about the biodiversity and the wildlife coming into your garden that can help you grow and can help protect any crops that you might have in there as well. Okay, things like your ladybirds, uh, your frogs coming in to eat your slugs and stuff like that. Conserve non-renewable -re resources. In other words, try to avoid using things like peat and think carefully about water storage and things like that as well that will help you um, to use water butts and things rather than just keep pouring it out the tap all the time. Eliminate reliance on external inputs. And what I mean by that is compost, compost, compost. Every gardener should be composting. And that way you're not relying quite so much on bringing things in. Bringing things into your garden carries a risk of disease, of pest. And the best example I can give you there are things like New Zealand flatworms. You, those eggs for those things are absolutely minuscule. They're black. They're extremely difficult to spot in the soil. You don't want to bring them in on the bottom of a plant that you've bought in. So try to eliminate your reliance on external inputs. I always quarantine anything that comes into my garden. It goes into a, a separate space first and I check that there's no bugs or anything on it before it comes into my garden. Maintain your soil fertility and build that biodiversity within your garden. The biodiversity is your best defense against other pests. Avoid the use of things like quick release fertilizers and pesticides, obviously. And manage your pests and diseases organically using that biodiversity, using things like resistant cultivars. Now, anything that's a cultivar is okay. The clue is in the word cultivar, cultivated. In other words, we've had an influence into it but these are plants um, which have been bred together but will breed true because they're not inbreeding. There is variety within these cultivars. Cultivated variety cultivar, it's an abbreviated word. So they are okay. Physical barriers, things like putting up netting, pesticides derived from plant extracts, 
So you do get things out there like citrax, for example, which is a garlic based and a plant ex extract based disinfectant if you want to wash your pots and things. Crop rotation of your plant species will also help. And of course, any of the naturally occurring predators and parasites that you have within your garden. OK, they will definitely help you. Just a wee quick shot. This was my garden when we moved in. Um, a little bit bare looking and not a lot of wildlife coming into it at all in any sense. And then now, this was actually last spring, I think. You can see my peony's got a bit of protection on it there to protect it from the wind. And I've got a bit of a windbreak up to protect some new plants that had been put in. But that was just within a year. Okay, I think that was maybe 2018, actually. Okay, so that's us. Um, I hope I haven't confused you all um, with that. So I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully I can see all your lovely faces again. There we go. Am I back? Yeah, yeah you're back, pal. Well done. Like, I, I'm just giving you a little round of applause. That's a no. huge subject. <laughs> That's a massive subject, yeah. It's, and it's also one that subject. I don't. Yeah, it's also <laughs> one I don't understand either. So I don't fully yeah. understand it. Um, it's very it's complicated. I, okay. I I learnt things then. <laughs> the what? The what? <laughs> love a, love a student that's got her names. Um, but like in summary, those links that we set up are really good places to go to. Um, yeah, and and ask questions. And also, we we've been very lucky that we've been supported because we're doing this course also with the Leg Learning Centre. Um, they supported us by sending us a load of seed packets from Tamar Organics. So it is our absolute plan and intention to distribute seed packets to people in this group in the next few weeks to get you started from Tamar Organics, which are an absolutely fantastic company. And we will talk a bit more about how we're gonna do that next week. But yeah, stay tuned because seeds, given the pandemic, have been really hard to get hold of. Charlotte said about real seeds. Yeah, real seeds are a brilliant company to use but they've been discovered by everybody um so they open up their books yeah they're on <laughs> limited they times again, about they? 20 minutes later don't they <laughs> but um they're a great website for seed saving um as well so if you are working with um, organic or heritage varieties you can seed save from them which is really like one of the most powerful things i think you can do as a person you know in terms of sort of like radical action <laughs> Um, especially somewhere like this up in Cape Les, where your seeds and plants will adapt after you've been growing them for several years and seed saving is actually really easy to do with a lot of varieties. Um, I would encourage everyone to, to do a bit of research and start seed saving and put the power to the people. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're quite right. You're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really good. Um, it is 10.48, so we're ever so slightly yeah. over, so we will not Sorry. be offended if people run away. I'm going to stop recording. Will we knock around just for five minutes to bash through some of these questions, Jill, that have come of up? Of course, yeah, I'll do my best, of course. <laughs> well, I'll stop recording now. So we'll do it okay. <laughs>